Good day to you. Whether you like it or not, you've been inundated by news about the coronavirus for some six weeks to two months now. It's only been increasing, and every day seems to be a steady rhythm of information pouring in from outside of the world about how other places such as Italy, China, France, the UK are suffering through the coronavirus, and how others such as Singapore and South Korea, Korea have done quite well. Do you know that information? Is that information, though, really coming in from outside sources, or is it being filtered through the U.S. media? Are you hearing CNN reports about this information, for example, rather than CCTV, which is the China television channel that's Channel 9 that's available on most cable systems? And so that sets up our question for today, which is to ask, really, what is it like when you circle around the world and look at media in terms of the media that are being imported and media that are being exported. We're taking on media imports and exports today. I think you're going to have a fun time with today's country media post because you really be able to take your analysis of your own country to a new level. And as I move through the concepts here that I want to talk about, I hope you do start to consider your country in your mind and ask those questions to yourself. And the questions that I want to start off with include, when you think about it, growing up in the United States, what foreign media have you been exposed to by virtue of that foreign media coming into this country? You know, if you were my generation, about the only thing you ever got to see was was the BBC, maybe, and Monty Python, which is a very old 1970s comedy from Britain. You might occasionally see a French film that somehow makes it onto a PBS channel. But other than that, there's not much. There's not much coming in from Canada. You, you probably can't even name a single Canadian television show, can you? And then Mexico. It's, you know, we don't even know who the president of Mexico is. Yeah, I'll, I'll reveal that later. And well, I'll reveal it now. It's Antonio Lopez Lobrador. We don't even know that because Mexican news is not pouring in to our country. And so the United States typically has not had a lot of media imports coming in from other countries. Now, today that's changed. On Netflix right now, I'm watching an incredible an incredible series called Money Heist. It's set in Madrid, Spain. And I put it as actually much more suspenseful and has many more plot twists and has incredible character development. I put that even better than this show, Breaking Bad, which many people thought was, was taking television to its pinnacle. On the other hand, so what I'm saying is today there is at least more potential of foreign produced media content to be making it into the United States because of the internet, because of streaming services. But you have to know about it to go find it, right? And I'm certain that somebody in this class is now going to watch that series as you're homebound from coronavirus just because I mentioned it. You happened to bump into me and I mentioned it. And as far as Breaking Bad, that's a good illustration of the other side of the coin, the United States. How many countries do you think have access to this uniquely American television series, which is finished? It finished on Netflix years ago, but it, it broke new ground in terms of, of taboo subjects and involving drugs and young people. It's uniquely American. It's uniquely American. You have a high school science teacher who uh, has a, a terminal medical condition and wants to provide for his family. And so he hooks up with one of his students and they start producing and selling methamphetamine, which grows into an international drug cartel. And uh, yeah, that's the basic of the plot. And that's very interesting to a lot of the world. And so there are a lot of the world knows about the United States, but it's not just Breaking Bad on Netflix. In almost every country, any night on television, you can see American television shows. At almost every movie theater, even in the smallest villages in Africa, you can find an American film. And the same goes to some extent for radio songs. You get a lot of American radio, a lot of American musicians, I should say, being exported around the world. So there's a little introduction to the United States as we continue forward and start to discuss in more depth some of the concepts that are involved in considering imports and exports. Some exports, plainly put, are purposeful. They're purposeful. They're meant to follow people. They're meant to be targeted at people outside of the country. The United States, for example, has has Radio Free Cuba. Radio Free Cuba is targeted at Cubans. It's targeted at Cubans to try and get them to move away from communism. So we have boats in the Caribbean 
that are broadcasting into Cuba. We have satellite satellite radio that's making its way into Cuba. We used to have the same service during World War, just prior after World War II, called Radio Free America. Uh, radio Free America? No, Voice of America. Voice of America, and then there was also Radio Free. There's so many different programs. They're often extensions of the military. It's just an example of an export that's designed to target people. China is targeting the United States and the rest of the world which it, with its CCTV-9. If you watch CCTV-9 on television, I encourage you to do so. I'm sure you have it on your cable system may not even know about it. It's China. It's purposefully funded by the Chinese government to present an image of China around the world that is more accommodating to Chinese interests and to try and demystify it and portray it more positively. So some imports, some exports are purposeful. They're, they're designed by governments and companies to, to reach other populations. Whereas other imports, other exports or imports, depending on which side of the equation you're looking at, are more accidental. When you travel, and as many people used to do before the coronavirus, and increasingly so, you meet people in other countries, you look for conversations, and you strike up conversations about films, about television shows, about streaming series, about stuff you can find on the web about apps on your phone, you start sharing information and then people start saying, hey, you know, my friend turned me on to this show, Breaking Bad, they're from America, you've got to see this show. And so that kind of an export is accidental. Behind what is possible in the interchange of imports and exports around the world are the new media technologies, the electronic technologies that make it so easy to share media content around the world. I'm talking about satellite systems. I'm talking about cable TV systems. I'm talking about streaming services. I'm talking about wireless on your phone and on your laptop. The electronic world has made it so easy to transport that content, whereas in the old days, if you wanted to export newspapers, you had to go put them on a ship or an airplane and send them out, etc. So especially when it comes to print publications. Now let's consider the larger question of why does exchange take place? Why does exchange take place between imports and exports? Why do we have countries exchanging information to begin with? Well, the first reason is due to geographical proximity, when countries, in other words, are close to each other. Ideally, you would say that because the United States and Canada share a really long border, that there would be more Canadian programming coming in, but that's not the case for other reasons that we'll discuss shortly. However, you can drive up to Canada, as I usually do with my students in the undergraduate version of this class, Comparative Media. I take them to Montreal, and we take a tour of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation there in beautiful Montreal. But we get within 15 miles to the border, and already we're hearing French-language music and French-language discussion programs and, and French-language programs mixed with, with English-language programs because Canada has that one French province of Quebec, which is French-speaking, and the rest are English. So this is very natural when you have countries that are next to each other. And think of what that's like if it's a smaller country. Think about your own country right now. It's a smaller country and is surrounded by a lot of countries, right? And all the borders there where information can flow across. Here in the United States, we've only got two countries, only two countries that we border. That's really amazing for the size of our land. So we've got geographical proximity. We also have common history. Common history is a way... That, that facilitates the exchange of media content between countries. If countries were at war together in the past, in the United States and Britain was at war for a long time. You know, we, we broke away from Britain with our revolution to found our own country. But now look at us, we're, we're buddy buddy, we're friends. I mean, Boris Yeltsin, I'm Boris Yeltsin, Boris Johnson is being covered right now as a coronavirus victim. How many other leaders of the world have coronavirus that you even know about? It's, it's because Britain has a favored kind of position. We're interested in news from Britain. The royal family is always, always of interest. And, and what's happening now with, with, with Meghan uh, is just incredible. With Meghan Markle is incredible the amount of attention that Americans are paying to English, British, royal information. And that's because of our history together. It's our history and we have a shared language. We are taking us back in some of this discussion today to our earlier discussion back in chapter two when we talked about globalization, talking about information flow around the world and why that happens. And one of the reasons is when countries have a history together and they also have a shared language, it's going to facilitate, it's going to facilitate more interaction. Really small countries like Haiti, which is a French-speaking country, which is really, really poor, where are they going to look to for television and film and radio? They're going to look to France. 
they're going to look to France for that. So they have a, a history together, even though France pulled out of Haiti a long time ago and not in the most pleasant way. Now let's talk about the third dimension that helps uh, why countries exchange information, and that is unique relations between the two countries. Those unique relations could be created because of trade, because of marriage between two people who are related to each other. Uh, trade is a great one to focus on when looking at China and Italy. Italy had started investing very much in China, and China had started very, investing very much in Italy. They had a huge trade relationship, and it's no coincidence that the coronavirus took hold in Italy right after China and Italy has suffered very much since then. All it seems to be coming down that apex right now, we think. So there are special relations that take place between different countries. You can say that sometimes it's ethnic based, sometimes it's not. You can say there are special relations between the United States and Israel, right? Those are special relations. Israel has a lot of uh, special exceptions in foreign policy because of the special relations that it has because of the uh, there are more Jewish people in New York City than there are in Israel. It's a special relations situation. Now let's go on to categories. Categories that we can place on countries to describe their interchange, their, their balance between imports and exports. And the first category that we want to talk about is the ethnocentric category. The ethnocentric category, if you're an ethnocentric country, it means that you are mostly producing and consuming your own media. And there's really very little foreign media, imported media that make its way into your overall landscape, your overall landscape of media. An ethnocentric country is, is brought about by different reasons. One is they are usually geographically isolated. Like it's tough to get media content into them because they're far away and they're isolated. We've already mentioned that the United States has uh, just two countries that it borders with. And so you want to get a newspaper in here, especially from Europe, you do still have to put it on an airplane unless you're going to direct people to the web page. And same with books and, and even films have to be shipped often physically. Uh, this probably holds true for Australia. I've not studied Australia, but being so far away from the world and New Zealand being so, so far away. So one factor that goes into a country being ethnocentric, producing mostly its own content, not really receiving other content, is that it's economically vibrant. And that means that it can actually pay for its media industry. It can pay for the infrastructure needed to develop an internet uh pay for internet infrastructure, pay for the infrastructure for television, pay for the infrastructure of radio, for cable. These are expensive propositions. To lay out a cable system usually requires an investment of 10 years before you start making money because all that line that you have to string and all the equipment that you have to build out. So you got to be economically vibrant. You got to have the professionalism. In the United States, we have many schools of journalism in television production here at East Stroudsburg University, we have a broadcasting concentration training students. That's not an automatic in other countries. And so you have to have an economically vibrant system. And in the United States, we've already established that our system is almost predominantly capitalistic. It's money-making. So on top of our economically vibrant system, which includes multi-million dollar media companies like Fox and CBS, CNN, MTV, which is part of the Viacom empire. I mean, media are really big money makers and they really jack up our economy. But on top of that, you have capitalism as a predominant mode. So these companies are not going to be interested in allowing foreign media imports to come into here unless they can purchase a show such as uh, Pop Idol, which then became our American Idol. Pop Idol was founded by a German television company that owned a television station in England called Five, Channel Five, and that station came up with Pop Idol, you know, where you have a contestant that is an amateur trying to make it big in the music world, and they get voted on by a panel of judges, and they have a certain format to that show, and the United States said, hey, you know, this is be great for us. Fox did anyhow, and Fox said, we're going to buy the copyright to that and bring it into this country. So you might have some infiltration, if I can use that word, of imported media content from other countries. But by and large, the ABCs of the world, which is really Disney and all the other media companies, they're not interested in opening up the American market to foreign media imports. They want it for themselves. And so let me just mention a follow-up to that, which I was alluding to when I talked about American Pop Idol, and that is when media content does come into this country, often what happens is it gets modified, cleansed, sanitized, however you want to say it, cleaned up so that it fits in 
with the American way of looking at things. Even that show, Pop Idol, was just a generic show in Britain. But when it came to the United States, we're very interested in being patriotic and being Americans and showing your, your duty and your love of your country. We expect that of people in the United States. And so we changed it to American Idol. American, we made it about us as a people, American Idol. Same with the celebrities that we get from Canada. Did you even know that Justin Bieber or Jim Carrey are Canadian? Did, did you know that? Yeah, so did you know that the, the Pamela Anderson is Canadian? I mean, you know, these are kind of older characters from, you know, more my generation than yours, but you know about these people. Not Justin Bieber's, not, not my ears, but you know about Justin Bieber. You don't think of them as Canadians, right? They don't even sound like Canadians. They sound like Americans. They become Americanized when they come into the country. That's what, that's what happens in ethnocentric countries. Now let's go on to exocentric countries. This is the next kind of category. Exocentric countries are the opposite, right? They are the countries that mostly take in media content from other countries. They're, if you were to look at their television schedule at night, you, you don't find maybe more than 30% of their own programming or 50% perhaps. It's their own programming. The rest is coming in from other places in the world. What makes these countries exocentric? Well, first of all, they're usually small. They're usually small, and because they're small, they don't have the scale where they can develop multiple industries like agriculture and industry and uh, manufacturing and tourism, all that. Uh, they usually are reliant on tourism or one particular product like bananas. And so they're small, but they're also often vulnerable and uh, to outside influences. And these two factors together make it hard for them to produce their own media content. Now, it was a number of years ago that I was in Ghana, but when I was there right around uh, yeah, 2007, I was, I was shocked that television in Ghana still was not 24 hours a day because they just didn't have enough programming. And of the programming that they were offering, they had to run a lot, a lot of Nigerian music videos because Nigeria was the only country that was close to Ghana where English was spoken. The other countries surrounding, surrounding uh, Ghana, like Ivory Coast, are French-speaking. And so, you know, you're looking for another place and you, you're a poor country yourself and you're trying to get a hold of other media content. That's good. Nigeria is a viable option there. And so small countries are usually exocentric. They're usually vulnerable to, uh, to, 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 uh, to a disadvantaged economic, uh, economic system in their own country, which makes it very, very difficult for them to produce their own media content. They look to others. But also, they're just flat out surrounded by other countries. And you can't control what flows across your border when it's coming through the airways. You can't build a wall to stop a radio signal. It's coming into your country. And so if you're Costa Rica, if you're in Nicaragua, if you're uh, uh, a Congo, if you're uh, uh, like a Cambodia, these are smaller countries surrounded by other countries. And, and all along the border, you're going to have television programs coming in the country. You're going to have visitors coming into the country because you touch so many borders. And they're going to be bringing with them their ideas and their, their suggestions about media content. And sometimes they're bringing the media content themselves. Now let's go to what is clearly presented in the book as the ideal situation. And I'll explain why it's ideal in a few moments. And that is the world-centric category. The world-centric countries, those are countries that are, they have a great balance, right? They have a great, they send a lot of media content out and they also receive a lot of media content. So they have to have vibrant media industries. They have to be able to produce their own media content. But at the same time, there's an openness there, maybe by choice, maybe by just development of the country to other people's ideas. Uh, you take a, if I were to ask you, what's the most visited city in the world by tourists? Could you answer? I, you know, take a guess in your mind right now. The, the city that most people go to, it, it was before the coronavirus. I don't know if it will be after. Paris. More people go into Paris than ever, than any other country, any other city in the world. And so with all those people pouring in on a daily basis, and I've been to Paris many times, and you look around, you just see hordes and hordes of tourist groups going through the Louvre, the famous museum, going to the Champs-Élysées, going all over the Seine, which is the river that runs through Paris, looking at Notre Dame down in the Latin Quarter. Yeah, you have, you have uh, tons of people from all over the world. And so it's an incredible exchange that you're getting there, and it's impossible to keep those ideas out. And by the way, the country that I've heard that has the, the most diversity in the whole world is not actually a country, it's an island of Trinidad. Now, I've never been there. Maybe you have, but that's what I hear. We have the biggest collection of eclecticism 
eclectic peoples from around the world. Another feature of world-centric countries is often you are surrounded by other countries, which facilitates a lot of that interchange. But when you're surrounded by countries like France, which is bordered by nine or 11 countries, you have a lot more chance for media to come into that country. And then if you have a vibrant media industry, you're also producing content. And when you're a country like France as a former colonial empire consisting of, of Haiti and uh, French Guiana and uh, Quebec and even New Orleans here in our own country, you've got a network of, of audiences already out there, potential audiences that are, might be interested in your, in your content. So now that takes us to a concept that I introduced early on in the course. We haven't really played around with much that we want to finish out our instructor video with today, and that is the rhetorical perspective. And the rhetorical perspective is how are you invited by media content to make meaning of that content? But in this case, we're asking how are you invited by the flow of imports versus ex exports to make sense of the world? How are you invited? That's what the rhetorical question is here. And we can say that those countries that are ethnocentric they have a rather black and white view of the world, a rather divide, a sort of an us versus them. And so you can hear that in the talk in the United States. You can hear, you know, all communist countries are bad. We can, everything about Cuba is bad. You want to talk about socialists in this country, socialism? Why don't you, uh, why don't you move away if you don't like it here the way that it is? You know, Iran, it's horrific. It's a horrible country. Uh, well, yeah, it also happened to have invented uh, algebra. Is that something we should maybe mention once in a while back when it was Persia? No, we don't mention it. There's a black and white world in the ethnocentric country because people are fearful. They're fearful of the outside world because they're used to the familiarity of their own media system. And that also makes it hard for other media to come in. If you see a, 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 if you see a film and it's in subtitles, you might say, ah, I can't watch that. I can't watch that. I'm used to. Hearing. I don't want to work hard and read the words. I'm forcing myself, I'm not really forcing myself, but I thought I would be, to watch the Spanish language version of this Netflix show, Money Heist, uh, because I believe, first of all, that characters' voices should match the actual person who's acting. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to me. But also, I want to continue to practice, continue practicar mi espanol. I want to continue to practice my Spanish. And so, I'm doing that, but most people won't do that if they're an American. It's a familiarity thing. Most people will not watch uh, a game show from Britain if there are no prizes and there's no money and there's no clear way of scoring points. You won't watch that. It doesn't make sense. It's not. It's like trying to learn a new language in one get-go, and we don't want to do that. You want a show like that, look up Never Mind the Buzzcocks. It's a British comedy. I don't know if it's still running. Never Mind the Buzzcocks. Take you a little bit to get used to it. It's a game show. It doesn't follow any of the rules that you've seen before in American game shows. So ethnic ethnocentric countries do have people that grow up in them who are invited to kind of have an insular view of the world. They're, you know, It's us against them. This is the safe place. I've seen everything I need to know about the rest of the world. If I really want to get adventurous and learn about another country, I'm going to go to Disney World and go through the It's a Small World exhibit. And that'll give me a taste of the beautiful Switzerland people with their, with their shoes and their milk and their chocolate and their cowbells. That's an, that's it. I'm, I'm ridiculing in a way. I'm not meaning to, but I'm trying to describe in extreme terms the rhetorical effect of growing up in an ethnocentric country. Other countries who are more world-centric, to compare that, they tend to grow up with a broader view of the world. They're more open to other ideas. They're able to discuss really difficult subjects and not feel threatened. A country like France, for example, when they renew, when they take applications for radio stations, you have to contribute to the mix. So you want to be an anarchist radio station? You want to be a communist station? You want to be a right-wing fascist radio station? The question is not whether it's bad for the people. The question is whether that station is going to add to the mix of available genres in France. Because France never wants to go back to the fascist rule that they had during World War II, where they just let one voice of fascism dominate media and the country fell to Germany. So world-centric countries are more open to other ideas. They're more tolerant. They're more understanding. And that's what you're rhetorically invited to do. Exocentric countries, those countries, you know, it's tough to categorize the rhetorical invitation, but one rhetorical invitation is to see your own position in your country as being less valuable to people in other countries. Because everything you're seeing portrays 
bigger houses. It portrays happier families, higher production values, more wealth, and more different, different kinds of food and activities that people are involved in than you're involved in. And so you tend to have a diminished view of yourself if you grow up in an exocentric country, if you're exposed to a lot of foreign media. So there are some ideas for you to have considered during this video lecture on your own country today. And I'm hoping that you have a lot of fun with the research today as you design your country media posts, as I want you to focus on what kind of a country is yours? Is it exocentric? Is it world centric? Is it ethnocentric? And for what reasons? What reasons can you find in your research today to back up your discussion posts? Have a great day.